Grazie. Such a gentleman. Welcome, Mario. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. We know you've got a busy schedule. Um, just a few of the things that we wanted to talk about. But first, let's focus on the table. Because this whole path coming from farm to table, it's maybe the place that we are really most familiar with. Maybe not all of us have been on farms. So maybe first, Let's start with a video of a farmer that's featured in your brand new book, America, Farm to Table. Uh, it's a video of Tim Stark of Eckerton Hill Farm. So maybe let's start with that and take a look. Perfect. Okay. If you're not going to grow it in your garden, you should know your farmer and know how your farmer is growing the vegetables that you're eating and how your farmer is raising the meat that you're eating how your farmer is milking the cow. It's really important. You're often cutting out a lot of chemical use and the flavor is just much better because the food does not have to sit in a refrigerator for weeks on end until it gets to you. When I see vegetables that look perfect in the grocery store, I'm very suspicious because I know the kind of creatures that like to attack those vegetables. Our vegetables on the stand all look imperfect. They have holes in them, They're, they look lopsided. Maybe before I farmed, I might have thought, oh, I don't want that vegetable that has holes in it. But now I, I, um, I'm suspicious of the one that looks perfect. So that was Tim Stark of Eckerton Hill Farm in Pennsylvania, two hours west of New York City. And his tomatoes are featured in your new book, America Farm to Table, in a recipe for spicy ricotta and tomato grilled cheese sandwiches. Correct. So can you talk about the table and where that so we see and we taste that sandwich. How does your relationship with a farmer like Tim give us that amazing grilled cheese sandwich? Well, the farmers, <clears throat> 20 years ago when, we opened up my, when I opened my first restaurant in New York City, we would go to the farmer's market, we would buy what we thought looked good, and we would take it home, very much like a regular consumer, and that is not a bad relationship. Uh, in that time that has evolved in 20 years, We've gone to just buying a few tomatoes that we thought to actually building our menus around having those tomatoes in particular varieties, including the Sungles that had that beautiful dewy shot there. Um, so now we actually ask them to grow a specific stuff. We actually guarantee them a price per pound and say we'll buy it all. And not necessarily to the exclusion of the farmer's market regular consumers because we never buy it all, but we'll buy as much as he wants us to have. What you'll get is a much wider biodiversity. They won't just grow three or four tomatoes, they'll grow 35 tomatoes because for a particular salad, a particular sandwich, we want 16 tomatoes, just because we're that way. 16 so, tomatoes for one sandwich? Well, 16 tomatoes in one salad. Because we'll do a tasting of the different tough. varieties yeah. so that you understand the magnificence of that tomato and also the tomato-ness is reflected and also shows itself in better ways in different flavors and understanding that the largest problem in my opinion about what's going on with our world as big farms start to tell us what makes more sense for them is that biodiversity is shrinking and maybe there were 400 kinds of apples in the 1700s cultivated and eaten in America. Now it's probably down to 20 that you could recognize. And there'll still be another 100, but they're not commercially available. And for the simple reason that, that no one wants to buy a, a red crimson apple from Rhode Island when they could get a, a honey gold or a ginger crisp or whichever one that's enjoying the fame now. So what we're looking at is trying to make sure that in addition to having the kind of beautiful opportunity to, to showcase the vegetables that these farmers, or even meat or oysters or chicken, whatever we buy from our farmers, we want to show off the amplitude of the, their potential. And people will come to the restaurant because they can get things that they don't necessarily see somewhere else. So we've created a kind of hybrid product, something that feels a little bit more luxurious, when in fact it's actually going backwards historically by extending the varieties available and helping the farmer make sure that they monetize that so that no one's not buying the the black Russian tomato or the Cherokee heart tomato or the ones that maybe don't look so well like Tim was just telling us there. So speaking of the stuff that doesn't look so good necessarily, why Mario Batali isn't perfect looking produce at our store? Because that's what we go for. We always say you, you taste with your eyes first. Why isn't that perfect looking produce always the perfect tasting produce? Well, think about it. If you're growing stuff, 
and your idea was to make it absolutely perfect visually, it might be that you're choosing things that don't necessarily have the same depth of flavor or the same idiosyncrasy of flavor. And you'll choose if I was going to ship tomatoes 500 miles or 1,000 miles or 2,000 miles, I would start to think about packing the ones that hold their shape the best so when they get to the market they do better. That isn't necessarily chosen for its flavor, but maybe it's chosen for its shape and consistency or it's chosen for its lack of moisture at a certain harvest time so that I can ship it better. And that is also a very good decision making process. But if we're looking to maintain biodiversity, which is my case that we should be, we should also be thinking about the deliciousness and the odd looking things every now and then. In my opinion, odd is more beautiful than perfect anyway. So because we need to talk about biodiversity, sometimes the easiest way to hook us in is with that you know, really terrific flavor first. So even though we've probably heard about the sun gold as being like you were saying, sometimes like the famous produce, can you describe the flavor of a sun gold? Like we grew up on tomatoes, you know, like we know what a tomato looks like, tastes like. What does a sun gold taste like? Well, in its heart, it is still just a tomato, but it happens to be the very first cherry tomato that is available at, a, at the acceptable ripeness. In our restaurants, predominantly, we don't serve raw, fresh tomatoes uh, outside of July till about October. Um, there's a demand for them, but we just don't serve them because we don't think that that's the natural bounty of the North American continent at that time of the year. You'll get good tomatoes from Florida and California, but I'd rather buy local tomatoes and use them only when they're in season and use canned tomatoes the rest of the year, which doesn't bother me or offend me in any way. So uh, a single tomato is slightly sweeter, in my opinion, there's a slight more almost tannicness to it in the background, but that's almost always overwhelmed by the sweetness. So it's an explosive, sweet, bright, sunny tomato that has a little tannin from the skin, which makes me think of a little tiny bitterness, which is what pairs it so well when I put it in a spaghetti sauce or in something that I just serve it with raw. Okay, so we all have to look for that beginning of next season when tomatoes are back. In well, there's, there, they'll be the very last tomatoes, right? Have we gotten a first frost in Chicago yet? I don't think so. Not yet. Not so the yet. last Listen. thing that the plant gives up after a first frost are the green tomatoes, which also have a delicious flavor. And we use them of, of all the varietals. We use green tomatoes for making pickles. We also do a little bit of breading and just saute them and serve them with a slightly spicy tomato conserva. But I mean, there's a thousand ways to look at the end, the last gasp of a season can almost be as good good as it's first or when it's in its most productive time. That's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. So if the squirrels don't get to your green tomatoes first, we'll, we'll get to those next. So <laughs> that's a whole other talk. <laughs> so we're curious, how does food actually get from a farm to your table, whether it's at the restaurant or your home kitchen or the television studio? How does it actually get to you? It's a complicated process yeah. because, in fact, we all live in a 12-month year. And in our gardens, in our farmer's markets, particularly at this kind of a latitude, we're always looking at something that really doesn't produce much until June and doesn't really produce much after November. So a lot of it travels as, as far away as from California. And it's brought over by fast trucks driving above the speed limit, driven by people taking drugs they might not want to take, <laughs> so that they can get those vegetables on time. And I appreciate the efforts of all of them. But I would say that unless you have to, trying to buy locally in as much as you can, of course you're gonna to wanna to have a crisp salad on your menu at the restaurant. So we're gonna buy something from a distance away. But if we can shorten that distance as best we can, and if we can become voters in the process by which those particular companies or farms grow their process, then that's where we enter the conversation. And although we're not giant restaurants, I have 25, I have, I have 2,500 employees, that's still not a big vote when you talk to the lettuce people or the broccoli rob people. So we choose the things that look like they've been able to withstand the travel as much. We try to use as much as we can in the pickles and preserved vegetables that we do throughout the season. And then we just kind of, you got to live with it. Every now and then you got to bite the bullet and serve spinach when spinach wasn't around. Because that's okay. It's just not a good way to live. Like you shouldn't constantly choose things that are shipped 3,000 miles away. If you could choose something that's even a little weirder or a little less obvious or maybe a little more difficult to prepare, but it's from a local place because you're doing good for the community. We, we like weird too, I think. So I what's think, a, yeah, so what's a good weird, like underserved salad ingredient that we should be getting right now? Right now you're looking at the beginning of the cruciferous light greens. So you'll see something like Russian red kale, dinosaur kale. You'll see the beginning of cabbages and Brussels sprouts. Again, the, yeah. the cruciferous members always do well after that very first frost. They don't get damaged at all. And we serve them raw. And one of the things that, one of the lessons that I try to give to people is if you find something at, in the vegetable department at a grocery store and you don't even know what it is, I can guarantee you 
that if you take it home, cut it into half inch pieces, put it on a cookie sheet with some extra virgin olive oil, put it in a 450 degree oven, in 15 minutes you'll have something that's delicious, no matter what it is. If it was <laughs> celery root, zucchini, a pumpkin, a vegetable you've never seen before, I can guarantee you it will be good. And you should try those weird ones because they're generally less expensive. I mean, there's kukutsa right now. It's the end of kukutsa season, which is that long, voluminous zucchini that has the world yeah. little twirly thing on it. I can tell you that if you roast them like that, they'll stay relatively firm. But if you saute those pieces with that world little cur curlicue that's on the end of the vine, that tenderizes it. Now, I wouldn't have learned that in a cookbook. I learned that from a Sicilian woman cook. And that's the kind of information that you need to kind of purvey a little bit. But don't be afraid of the odd. Embrace the odd. <laughs> We're, but we don't know because it's a big gourd, a decorative gourd at the end of the produce aisle where it's decoration. So cut it up, roast it, oil. Okay, so that's... But anything. The, yeah. A banana will give you the same delicious <laughs> results. A piece of cabbage will do it too. All right. Hot that's oven, oil, recipe. salt. Pretty okay, good. Okay, that sounds amazing. We're getting so hungry here, right? Okay. So speaking of all these different ingredients... What do they look like when they arrive to you? We're curious as well, like, you know, when, because we kind of have an idea, I think, from what it looks like at the farmer's market, but you being in all these different venues, what do, what do they actually look like? Do they bring them to you in baskets? Are they, like, all scrubbed up? Like, when you actually start to work with ingredients, when it comes almost to our table, what state are they in? Well, we buy them on uh, several different levels. We buy them on the grocery store level. We buy them on the boutique fancy Del Posto four-star restaurant level. And we buy them on the pizzeria level. So we'll take them at any level. What, what's significant to us is that we get them. And in, 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 in New York particularly, it's almost like a bidding war happens when certain things come around. When it's raspberry and strawberry season, to get the local tri-star strawberries, you've got to get to the market early and you have to show up with cash or you're not going to see them. So sometimes they show up as if they're slightly disheveled and maybe even a little annoyed, these vegetables. But we don't mind that we'll take care of them. For us, when you buy at the top end, sometimes they come in fancy, sometimes they come in with dirt still on them, and we're all right with it as long as we can get our hands on them. I think that's amazing because I think some people may not know that, um, like as you were saying, it's like a bidding war and that, um, you know, especially because you have such a huge concentration of restaurants and you have such a huge wide range of them, which is amazing. Um, so we always want to know about the chef's creative process. For you personally, like, what is your setting when you start to think about a new dish that you're going to serve, present either on television or that you're going to make for your family dinner? Um, what's your creative process like when you're... Well, what, what gives us the most juice creatively is to make sure we walk through the wholesale markets of the fish, the meat, and the vegetables always. And at least once a week, someone on our team is up at, you know, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, or still up at one o'clock or two yeah. o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and maybe even drunk they're going to that market. As long as they go, I don't care how they get there. As long as they're not driving drunk, I want them to go there. And if they stumble past the zucchini and bump into the right ones. But we see that in the market. What, and, 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 I, and I also know the seasons. I've been living in New York for 20 years. So I know when the first asparagus or green wheat or when I could even use hops or when morels might be available or when, when shiitake mushrooms are actually wild as opposed to farmed and when the wild striped bass, which is right now. Wild striped bass and bluefish are banging into the market. So we're making sure that we use those in the menus, not only because it's less expensive when it's in season and local, but also because it captures that unique and ethereal flavor of the specific region. And when you talk to Italian cooks and, and a lot of illuminated American cooks like Stephanie in the back right here, we know that capturing the flavor of our very specific position is, is a privilege and, and it's a luxury to be able to do it. So if I can capture something like, like Michigan whitefish or, or walleye, you serve those on the menu here, it's better than everywhere else because it didn't travel. So if we can identify those things, follow their season, understand what morels are from this region and use them during season, then we are, first of all, saving money but we're also doing a service to the region by celebrating its uniqueness from the Southwest or from the Pacific Northwest or from New York City or anywhere else that happens to have delicious produce. And in every single state in the country, there's something remarkable and unique that people celebrate, whether it's fancy or not. They're there all the time. And this is a big deal. This is a really important I, part. I think it's the most important part yeah. of the flavor component of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. For me, serving delicious food is my first thing. Serving slightly provocative food is my second thing. Serving nutritious food follows those three things. And then being able to price it for my, for my, for my customers so that they can find it and get a hold of it. You know, we have restaurants that have entrees from $10 to $70. And finding a place for each of those products and finding it to work for the business so that we can promulgate this whole ideology is a real significant part of our business. Which is something that we bring then back to our home kitchen rather than starting with a menu or a recipe 
you go to the store and see what's good rather than, oh, I got to shop for all the stuff that's on this. Well, place. right. There's two ways to shop. One is that yeah. you look at your recipe in the magazine or the cookbook and you go to the right. store and you buy all the stuff exactly as it is, which is admirable. And th that's how you build your technique ability. And then what you do is you realize, you know what? I'm just going to go see what's really good at the store. Then you know how to sear the meat. You know how to roast the vegetables that we just talked about. You know how to post uh, po poach or blanch asparagus. You know how to deal with kukutsa. You know how to deal with all of these other things. And you put them together in simple ways. You look at a, a recipe book or a magazine article more like inspiration, but you really want to identify the products that are the freshest, the least expensive, and the most available right now, because those are the ones that are going to give you the most delicious stuff. So. What's your experience with a farmer and chef relationship in that creative process? Because when, you know, as we were saying, it's like back in the day, it was farmers gave you ingredients. And then now... Well, they sold them to us. I mean, they never uh, gave them to us. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, they might give them to you. you Maybe know, to but... try something. I mean, you know, <laughs> a, a good yeah. new weird vegetable. Exactly. The best yeah. way to market it is the way they marketed crack cocaine in the 80s. You let people taste it, and pretty soon they want more. <laughs> It's, 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 that's no you genius. You didn't need to go to Warden to do that, you know what I mean? <laughs> so speaking of uh, addictive new produce, maybe, um, because you're seeing, you know, you're Mario Batali. People are showing you, like, I'm Mario. I've got the most amazing thing or whatever. Because we're seeing sort of now, like, what was the thing that got you excited 20 years ago? Like, what's the next kale or the purple haze carrots? What are farmers bringing you that might be the next hot thing that because we're going to taste because of your relationship with the farmers. You know, often enough, it's not that they're bringing me products that they're test driving for me. What they'll do for me, and for anybody that brings them to them, we'll get seeds during our travels from all over Italy or Spain or France or Morocco or Southeast Asia. We'll bring the seeds back to them, and they will grow us the stuff. And they might develop a new product that they can sell to a bunch of other consumers outside of us. So it's, it's not necessarily that they found a new apple, because I've been there 20 years. It's hard to find a new apple. But, but they might find new shellfish. Like the, the shellfish people might find something I've never seen before. Or they'll tell me, listen, we've been, we've been breeding these chickens, and it's a Rhode Island versus a something else, and look at how delicious this is and how much more leg and thigh meat there are, which is far more interesting to me than a large-breasted chicken, mm -hmm. oddly enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so of those things, for example, since we've got the holidays coming up, maybe like what's one thing that you can give us a tip on as far as what we should be looking for, like the next thing that you're excited about? Well, you know, there's this store called Zingerman's in Ann Arbor. Yeah. And it's one of my heroic places. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that my son started at U of M just this last September, just <laughs> so we can go to Zingerman's a little bit more often. But they have these crazy southern products right now. I think the American South is where I'm finding a lot of my traditional ingredients. They have this dried, hardened, slightly ground corn that isn't ground like polenta, but I make like a little casserole just by cooking it with a little milk and a little gruyere. And it is so good. And it's, mm. it sings symphonic Freddie Mercury to me. When I'm <laughs> tasting this corn, I'm like, this is corn like dancing with Freddie Mercury as it would be. And you find, <laughs> for me, it's about finding old products that maybe have gotten lost or, or put aside and rediscovering them. And a lot of them are pantry items, not necessarily fresh items. As I go into the fall, I'm, looking, I'm always looking for my Brussels sprouts. I'm always looking for some kind of kale or cruciferous leafy stuff. I'm going to use some kind of sweet potato, garnet, yam, jam, whatever, all of those things. And then I'm, you know, when, I do a, when I go into my holidays, I always choose a theme. So this year's Thanksgiving theme is New Mexico. So we'll have the spices of New Mexico. We'll have, we'll have the hatch chilies. We'll have that kind of corn flavor in it. There'll be chorizo in the stuffing. It'll be a, that's how I look at it. That's what keeps me excited about it. But fundamentally, it's the same eight dishes. There's still some kind of mash. There's some really delicious gravy. There's a turkey with some stuffing in it. And, you know, the other things that go around, it'll come along with the cranberry. This year, I'll make like a cranberry salsa. It's a little more zippy. But it's fundamentally about finding the right cranberry. That's the real deal. Mario, you're making us so hungry. So we could talk to you all day and night about food, but we're going to have to let you go. So we want to thank you, Mario. 